like to thank Sages for the opportunity to present our talk on um, long-term quality of life outcomes following Nissen versus two pay fundoplication in patients with GERD. We have no disclosures. So fundoplication is the standard uh, treatment of choice for GERD, refractory to medical management. The most frequently performed fundoplication is a Nissen or a 360-degree posterior wrap. Long-term success of this is well documented. 90% uh, of patients are satisfied with that choice of surgery, even out to 20 years. However, uh, Nissen does have frequent complications um, postoperatively, including dysphagia and gas-related bloat. So some surgeons use a partial fundoplication, such as a toupee or a posterior 270-degree wrap. Some in the surgical community have questioned the long-term dur durability of toupee, and multiple prospective randomized trials have compared Nissen and toupee, and several meta-analyses have found equivalent GERD rates, um, as well as rates of resolution and patient satisfaction after fundoplication, but increased rates of dysphagia and gas bloat after Nissen. However, few of these studies report outcomes beyond two years. So due to the lack of long-term data comparing Nissen and toupee and a particular paucity of quality of life outcomes, we sought to compare patient-reported uh, outcomes at one, three, and five years after laparoscopic fundoplication. So the Division of Minimally Invasive Surgery at the University of Wisconsin has a patient database, which includes all patients who undergo benign foregut surgery. Data are collected by administration of preoperative and then postoperative questionnaires by clinic staff and review of the electronic medical record by our database manager. And for this study, uh, we included patients who underwent Nissen or toupee fundoplication for GERD. And we excluded those who had a fundoplication for reasons other than GERD, such as achalasia. Quality of life was assessed at phone survey at one, three, and five years post-op. Three separate validated, quality, validated questionnaires were used. The GERD health-related quality of life questionnaire, you've already heard about it uh, at our, this session today, which um, evaluates heartburn, dysphagia, impact of medication on daily life with a scale of one to five for 11 separate questions. Higher score are, is worse symptom control. The gastroparesis cardinal symptom index evaluates postprandial fullness, satiety, nausea, vomiting, bloating um, on a severity scale, again, from zero to five with, again, higher scores meaning worse symptom control. And then finally, uh, the Eckert score evaluates dysphagia, um, regurgitation, chest pain, and weight loss on a scale of 0 to 12 with, again, higher scores indicating more severe symptoms. And then trends and outcomes over time were analyzed uh, via logistic regression or cochrane armitage trend test. Our cohort included 155 patients who had a toupee and 161 patients who had a Nissen. Toupee patients were slightly older, uh, more likely to be female. Toupee patients, not surprisingly, also reported a baseline dysphagia at higher rates, 42% versus 19% in the Nissen group. This was statistically significant. Comprehensive workup, including EGD, esophagram, manometry, and impedance pH is used prior to fundoplication at our institution. Toupee patients had uh, worse preoperative esophageal dysmotility, um, including lower maximal distal esophageal amplitudes, as well as a greater percentage of failed contractions as compared to the Nissen group. This indicates a greater baseline dysmotility among the toupee group. It should be noted the choice of fundoplication at our institution is surgeon specific and does not follow a strict protocol. Um, similarly, the uh, choice and use of specific preoperative workup components was surgeon specific. The vast majority of patients underwent EGD and esophagram in this group. 62% um, of patients underwent manometry and 53% of patients underwent uh, impedance pH testing prior to surgery. This uh, cohort does include hiatal and parasophageal hernia repair, and that is uh, the likely reason for those rates. Nissen fundoplication tend to be performed earlier in the study period, while toupee was formed at higher rates later in the study period, and this was significant. This table is response rates. Phone follow-up was attempted for all patients. Overall response rate was 62% in the two pay group and 65% in the Nissen group. Response rates were not significantly different across all time points. 
I do need to note that each of the following cohorts reflected the overall study population and their baseline characteristics, meaning when comparing patients with Nissen to patients with toupee at one year and then at three years and then at five years, those groups were similar to the overall Nissen and toupee comparisons with the differences in age and sex and um, primary complaint being similar. And this reassured us that we were comparing similar patients um, in, across the groups regardless of follow-up interval. Quality of life outcomes were evaluated um, both between the operations as well as across time as a trend analysis. There were no significant differences in GERD HRQL or the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index between Nissen and toupees. There was a trend uh, toward worsening GERD HRQL scores over time in the two pay group with a p-value of 0.07. <clears throat> and this was not present in the Nissen group. At one year, the Eckhart dysphagia score was higher in the Nissen group as compared to the two pay group. Um, this difference dissipated over time, uh, no difference at three and five year time points between Nissen and Toupee. Interestingly, um, in particular because the Toupee group uh, had a higher rate of dysphagia preoperatively. Um, it makes it more interesting that you'd see results like this. Over time, uh, use of PPIs increased significantly in the Toupee group. There was a trend for higher PPI use at five years um, with Toupee as compared to Nissen but this did not reach significance. And long-term satisfaction was equivalent and was universally high between the groups out to five years postoperative. There were no significant differences in satisfaction rates um, between Nissen or Toupe. These results need to be interpreted in light of the limitations. So it's a single institution study. It's a retrospective study. There's a relatively small sample size. Um, our institution performs a higher proportion of toupees than others um, due to surgeon preference, and this has increased over time. And uh, determination of success uh, using patient-reported symptoms alone need to be, needs to be evaluated with caution, as has been brought up already. And PPI use is probably an insufficient marker of GERD recurrence. We don't know why these patients were put back on their PPIs. Um, and the GERD HRQL score we obtained was regardless um, of PPI use, and we did not take that into account when um, recording or interpreting uh, the GERD HRQL score for patients. So in this study, we sought to evaluate the long-term impact on quality of life in patients undergoing laparoscopic Nissen or toupee. We found that Nissen and toupee report uh, similar, or um, provide similar uh, patient satisfaction, and both uh, fund application types also offer similar quality of life scores for GERD, gastroparesis, and dysphagia symptoms. Um, there is an increased use in P of PPI trend toward worsening GERD HRQL scores over time with the toupee, which is not seen in the Nissen. And I think this warrants additional investigation regarding the long-term durability of the toupee fund application. Thanks for your attention. Happy to take questions. Great. <laughs> yep. Dr. Luis. One of, the, one of the concepts that previously has been published is that patients with severe reflux disease, those with the worst grades of esophagitis, highest scores, and so forth, tended to not do as well with a toupee. Mm -hmm. Could you tease out of your data the people that tended to be failing or you thought were failing with higher PPI use or whatever, uh, what they started with? Was there, was there any difference in what they started with or, or nothing at all in that group that tended to be failing? Um, we do record the presence of Barrett's. It was ultimately relatively low and not different between the groups. And I did not tease out whether or not the failures um, in toupee were higher in those with Barrett's, but I probably should. Ralph A. Seattle. Uh, the GERD HRQL score has a specific metric for bloating, which would be interesting between those two procedures. Did you look at that specifically? But um, the bloating question specifically in yeah. the GERD HRQL, right? we did not, no. There's My also one in the gastroparesis symptom index. It'd be interesting to look at both of those between the groups, but also both of those, I guess, compared to each mm -hmm. other to see yeah. about patient reliability. Brian Louis, Seattle. Uh, it was very nice, and, and like the other um, 
commentators, I think it's an important topic. But you, you highlighted in your groups some differences at the outset of the baseline characteristics. They persisted through your time frames, um, but you haven't corrected for them. And so you have a mixed bag. You have some people who have GERD, some people have a large hiatal hernia. Like Dr. Demister said, you have some bad esophagitis, some not. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps you, you have enough people in there. Perhaps you ought to propensity match some of those, or at least try to match those groups so you get a better understanding of how you compare Tupé versus Nissen. And maybe that will give you a better understanding of what's going on between the two groups because you have an equity at the baseline and it's hard to compare those two groups. Yeah, very good point, sort of comparing apples to oranges with the groups. I think uh, it's still a relatively small sample size to try to do any propensity um, scoring, but certainly a reasonable thought. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone.